the gap between legal and IT, reducing risk and increasing efficiency in the management of corporate information, presented by Xilab. I'm your host, Robert Hilson of ASEDS, and I'm joined today by two uh, excellent returning presenters who I will introduce in a moment. Uh, but first, allow me two brief announcements on the next slide. I'd like to especially welcome everyone who is new to ASEDS. Uh, ASEDS, if you don't know, is a membership association owned and managed by Barbary that is committed to promoting e-discovery skill and competence through training, education, and networking. Uh, we also offer the certified e-discovery specialist credential, which is held by more than 1,000 practitioners, we're uh, proud to say, in the U.S. and globally. You can join today and start receiving a number of benefits that are exclusive to ASEDS members, including news content, uh, members-only webcast, our bits and bytes newsletter, uh, members directory and uh, and several other things, including uh, special access to benefits from our affinity partners, which now include EDRM uh, and true staffing partners. You'll see on this next slide that we will be holding our annual conference September 28th through the 30th at the Gaylord National Resort in Washington, D.C. Uh, a live certification prep course will precede the conference on the 28th. Uh, and we expect this to be our best show yet. We've announced a number of great speakers, including uh, all those judges that you see up there on your screen. Um, just yesterday, actually, we had three more uh, speakers confirm, including Craig Ball, who I assume uh, most of you know. Uh, so anyway, we're really looking forward to it. I encourage everyone to join us. Uh, if you want to know more about the conference, you can go to ediscoveryconference.com uh, and learn more about the program and the topics we'll cover. Uh, and if you feel so inclined, you can also attend. Okay, so uh, let's get to it. As I said, we have two excellent speakers today. Chris Dale heads the eDisclosure Information Project, which disseminates information about key legal technology to lawyers and their clients, uh, and to judges and to service providers. He was a member of Senior Master Whitaker's Working Party, which drafted the 2010 eDisclosure Practice Direction and Electronic Documents, uh, electronic documents Questionnaire. Uh, and he writes an authoritative and objective website and blog on the subject. Uh, Chris, thank you for, uh, for joining us. Welcome back. Thank you very much for asking me. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, it is also a pleasure to have Mary Mack here. Uh, Mary is Enterprise Technology Counsel for Xilab, uh, and she is an attorney and strategic advisor for some of the largest product liability class actions, internal and government investigations, and antitrust uh, and intellectual property disputes. Mary's clients include the largest law firms, pharmaceutical companies, and insurance companies in the world. Uh, she is a member of the Illinois Bar and the ABA's section on litigation uh, and is one of the leading speakers and authors uh, on e-discovery issues, technology, and the law. Uh, Mary, welcome back to you. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. It's great to be here. So let me quickly remind our audience that uh, we do encourage your questions. You can type them in, uh, and, and I will field them for Chris and Mary uh, by chatting them into the questions box that you see on the right of your screen. Okay, uh, Mary... Tell us a little bit about today's program. Well, we're very pleased to have Chris Dale here to, to, dis to discuss a topic that we've talked about around reactive e-discovery for quite a long time. How do you get legal and IT to cooperate when there's an emergency? Um, um, as we move into in information governance, there's a different type of cooperation needed. It's more... Uh, measured the information gover governance uh, project life cycle. And so there's a different way, I think, that legal and IT will come together to solve this problem. So our, our agenda today is going to talk a little bit about the data itself, um, some of the constraints when you actually have to uh, justify projects when they're not uh, emergent, and uh, the different people involved and and then how to talk about uh, some of the successes so Chris uh, do you want to add anything to the well, uh, agenda uh, I'll expand on it a little bit um, with a beginning perhaps with a quotation from Gartner which you'll find on the very last slide but which I'll give it here because it, it summarizes what we're trying to talk about um, Gartner said this being proactive requires the same approach just without the pressure of deadlines and that I think is, is um, uh, it gives us a cross link into e-discovery. Um, there's a difference uh, between, as, as Mary's just said, between e-discovery and the broad topic that comes under the label of information governance. Uh, and it's not just that one is reactive uh, and the other isn't. Um, the, uh, dealing with e-discovery, you can usually point to 
an urgent reason for doing it. There's a, a, a request from a regulator. There's a, a you've reached that stage in some litigation uh, or whatever. Um, and it's also perhaps relatively easy to measure. You can, if, you, if you're good, good enough, you can anticipate most costs. You can anticipate timelines and things. When you're talking about the proactive area that we're covering here, uh, it's rather harder. And that leads, whenever one talks about this, to a criticism from, from many people who say, well, all this seems sort of rather aspirational and non-specific, doesn't it? Um, uh, give me some hard figures. Tell me what I'm going to save, what I'm going to make. And uh, it's worth addressing head on that that isn't, um, isn't what we're trying to achieve here, and it's extremely difficult to do that in the abstract. Every company has different priorities. Every company has different problems. And all we can do really is outline the broad approach which you can apply uh, if you're facing those sorts of problems. In the, the circumstances where many companies will say, well, our resources, our people's time, our energies are better spent winning new business than worrying about this concept of information governance. Um, one of the, the points that we'd like to get over is that you have to consider the cost of doing that business. Winning business is fine. Um, but if it takes you twice as long to do the business because you can't find your data, um, then uh, a value consideration comes in quite apart from the risks uh, which lie hidden in data uh, and which may raise their heads at, at an inconvenient time. Some of that value is a sort of straight cash saving. Uh, if you can say it costs us X to do this and if we get rid of this, do that, do the other, uh, it'll cost us half X, then uh, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, some of it's sort of hard business asset data, which enables you to win pitches or to get jobs done faster with fewer resources and that sort of thing. Um, uh, a lot of it is, is less specific than that, but it, it nevertheless, so far as I'm concerned, is valuable to consider uh, what, those, what those factors are. Um, does that uh, cover what you wanted to cover there, Mary? It, 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 it does, and you, you've um, brought us a survey uh, of general counsel and what their sense of pain. Uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. This it, It's not a formal survey. It was, it was on Twitter, in fact, uh, a company that provides outsourced um, in, outsourced in-house counsel services called Lawyers on Demand in the UK, um, asked uh, some of the the, the GCs that it dealt with, what their pain points were, and we put them on the side there. And there's a pressure, increasing pressure to demonstrate value and work more efficiently. Uh, budgets are going down. Everybody wants things done faster and better. Uh, they're spending their time firefighting, and all that's very demotivating. Uh, all of that is um, understandable and interesting. What's interesting to me, though, uh, from a, uh, looking at it on my side of the Atlantic, um, there's no reference there to uh, discovery. There's no reference there to security. Um, both of which I think, uh, tell me if I'm wrong, Mary, but I think both of those would have turned up in the top five of a, uh, a USGC's list of priorities and pressures. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. The, certainly the security aspect has, has um, increased due to privacy breaches and intellectual property breaches and then just just the other day, uh, we saw what happened with uh, GitHub with a denial of service attacks. So I think that security, um, you know, is is right up there. I would say that the e-discovery is actually moving down in um, in concern in the U.S. Is, is that because they're getting better at it? I think. Well, you know, we're. We're almost 20 years in now. We're what 15 years in, and so there there is a bit of a rhythm to um, to e-discovery if if the companies have experienced it before. Um, and then I think also looking forward to the to the new federal rules. I think I think that there's some relief in there um, around sanctions that that are making people feel a little easier about e-discovery. And then the sanctions for privacy violations and security breaches are. Are going up. Those costs are going up. So I think I think that that those are um, uh, coming forefront. But the, but those two topics impact e-discovery as well. Yeah, and they're all related, aren't they? By the idea that uh, the more stuff you have, the bigger the problem you're going to face when any of these issues turn up, whether it's litigation or a breach or uh, a cyber breach or, or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, should we just look at, at the as it were conventional 
sources of data risk. Um, this isn't the, an exhaustive list, but it's three of the broad areas that, uh, that turn up that command attention. Um, litigation uh, is, is clearly a data risk. You know, there's a duty to disclose because the rules say so, but you've also got to assess your prospects and costs. Um, regulation, well, if you think it's difficult to comply with litigation deadlines, um, the arrival on your doorstep of, the, uh, of a regulator uh, or a letter from the regulator uh, tends to focus the mind uh, even more sharply and uh, is uh, not optional. You have to deal with it. Um, and uh, investigations, we're seeing more investigations. I don't know whether that's a byproduct of um, economic downturn or, or, or what, but we're seeing more investigations and partly dealing with actual problems, but also, again, this, this preemptive, proactive thing identifying potential problems um, before they turn up. Yeah. We can expand on that. Uh, no, I was just, I was just going to yeah. say the preventative law, um, law before, before the problems emerge. And I think that's, you know, that's where the cutting edge is. One of your colleagues over uh, on that side of the pond, Richard Susskind, has been um, evangelizing about that as well, you know, that uh, um, the greatest value the lawyers can bring is to actually head problems off before they become... Oh yes, uh, the, the fence yeah. at the top rather than the ambulance at the bottom. Exactly. That one. Yeah. Um, uh, litigation brings with it the, uh, a, 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 a duty to find out what you've got, to deal with, identify the scope to consider the method, how you're going to deal with this problem, what the costs are going to be. That's actually more uh, more sharply focused here in the UK, where we have a set of rules now which require us to, to deal with these things specifically. We must address scope. We must go to be able to go to the court and say, I've got this stuff, but it's not worth looking at. It's potentially disclosable, but I really don't think it, it adds much to the value of the case. This is how we're going to deal with it whether it's predictive coding or, or, or outsourcing or whatever it may be. And we also have to say what the costs are going to be. Um, in some cases, we have to, to arrive at a, a formal budget. Now, those may be uh, UK specific, those, those particular requirements, but actually they're the sorts of things that clients expect anywhere uh, and which any project actually requires. Uh, litigation is not different from uh, opening a new building or acquiring a company or going into a new... Uh, area of business or whatever. Um, what, what, what's the scope of this? How much is it going to cost us? How are we going to set about it? Uh, are and, all parts of any corporate project, really. And Chris, I think this is an area where we're going to follow, the US is going to follow your lead uh, in the UK as the rules change. The whole idea of putting formal budgets together uh, very early in a case and uh, the scope around the, the claims and defenses all of that is um, wrapped into the proportionality, which is moved up uh, in the new federal rules. So I think you're going to see quite a bit of interest uh, from the United States taking a look at the case studies and the uh, procedures you've all developed uh, in the uh, UK. The, the same is true, I, I've heard you say, and, and I agree in relation to privacy. The US is going to start looking at what happens over here. Um, exactly. So that's, a, that's quite a turnabout there. Uh, well, it because, is. It is. When I yeah. first went to the U.S. and everybody said, oh, the U.S. is two years ahead of, uh, of the U.K., I, I kept my counsel and, and shut up on the subject. But um, uh, it's, been, it's interesting to see uh, a, a slightly different focus coming. Privacy is an area we'll touch on in a minute. Um, but it, it's not so much a matter of any one uh, jurisdiction leading. It's that we're all learning from each other uh, what matters. Um, and clients are clients everywhere and they have much the same demands and one of those uh, is to keep the cost down and to uh, to get into uh, the, uh, the the problem as a project sooner rather than later. Um, a point uh, on this slide that's specific or, or, the, or that touches much on the whole subject of information governance, knowing, knowing what you've got um, uh, and that relates also back to that Gartner quotation I gave you. Um, that it's jolly expensive having all this done in a hurry at lawyer rates, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if you have recurring e-discovery obligations. Um, uh, you might well think retrospectively 
Uh, I wish we'd done something about that when we had um, a, a, a bit more leisure rather than paying uh, this very expensive law firm uh, to do it for us at their charging rates uh, in a great hurry. And it's, it is right to say, and I think we'll touch on this in a minute, that an awful lot of projects that could be put under the broad label information governance come because a company has had a bad experience. Uh, they recognize that they paid a lot more or, or were put at a disadvantage or in some way could have done better um, if they'd had a clearer idea of what they'd got. Yeah, regulatory requests bring, this, bring the same, uh, but magnified, as I said earlier. Um, at least in litigation, you know what the issues are. Uh, in, when the, the regulator shows interest, well, you know he knows something, but what does he know? Uh, and you have a, a sort of an uncapped um, scope here to find out how big the problem is. Uh, you'd rather find things before the regulator does. And that recurring point that the bigger the pile, the, the harder and more expensive it is to find anything, uh, is even more focused uh, when, you, when you're looking at regulatory requests. I'm sorry, Mary, I cut you off there. Oh no no I think I think that this is this is a big one because um, the uh, the panels that I've seen with the government regulators I was at Georgetown's uh, 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 corporate council conference uh, last month and it's all about being forth forthcoming and um, getting to those regulators first is so that it's um, the bad apple rather than you know a bad corporate um, profile. That gets that gets drawn. So, knowing what's knowing what's in the uh, in the documents before the regulators do is key to being able to to leverage those negotiations. It becomes a strategic and a and a tactical point, uh, as well as a purely mechanical one. Uh, yes. You mentioned you mentioned Richard Suskind earlier. Uh, one of his uh, things derived from asking around is if you ask lawyers, what are you um, uh, solely qualified to do. In other words, what are, you, what are you uniquely qualified to do of all the components in a dispute, um, uh, of which there are many of this drafting and this, um, the, the mechanics of discovery and all the rest of it, but what lawyers are you uniquely qualified to do? Uh, in the UK, they said um, strategy and tactics, and in the US, they said strategy, tactics, and advocacy. And um, if that's right, and I think it is, because almost everything else can be outsourced to somebody else, these are all things that lawyers might like to get good at. And the more you can focus on uh, how you get to the data that gives you the strategic input and implies or suggests a tactical route um, has got to be a good thing. Exactly. Um, the, the third head under these sort of the, the, the sharp, sharply focused data risks, uh, internal investigations of one kind or another, Mary's already mentioned IP theft, um, all sorts of financial wrongdoing, um, anticipating uh, compliance failures. The more that, are, uh, that the regulators press, uh, the more companies have to start in conducting investigations internally, uh, trying to find things before the regulator even turns up. Reacting to whistleblowers uh, becomes increasingly uh, an issue, even better to, to anticipate them, all of which uh, is a great deal harder if you've got more information information than you need, more data than you need. Um, uh, the traditional, the conventional ones, uh, departing staff who are going to make off with customer lists. Well, if you don't know what customer lists you've got, who can access them, uh, and those sorts of things, uh, you're on the back foot when uh, a problem actually arises. Um, all sorts of other duties that increasingly fall on employers, taking responsibility for the conduct of employees. Um, not just um, wide compliance things, but how do they behave to each other as they're bullying and, and other things that bring in HR. So there's another department. We're not just talking legal and IT here. There's HR coming in because one of the things that may lurk in the data uh, is, is things relating to conduct that you really ought to know about. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you get, uh, certainly in the EU, you get subject access requests. Uh, and everywhere you increasingly you have freedom of information requests, um, which people tend to write off as being, oh, they're small things to deal with, but actually they're not, particularly when you get a lot of them. Um, uh, the aggregate of all your uh, apparently small freedom of information requests can add up to the equivalent of a great deal of litigation. 
Um, yeah, our, our our government entities that we that we deal with are, are seeing many more uh, open records or freedom of information requests. And it, it, Chris, you're right. It seems like it should be easy, you know, just hand the data over. But we've seen what happens when you just disclose. Um, for example, when Jeb, Jeb Bush put the raw email files up on the on the website that contained some personal information. He had it down in 24 hours and mm. had scrubbed the files, but uh, the government has a similar obligation uh, to regular litigants to, to um, uh, protect information, be it privilege, trade secrets, various and sundry, but also the, the privacy data. Yep, and if you don't know what you've got or where it is or who's responsible for it, um, then it's kind of hard to know that you're on top of it. There's lots of interested parties here. Uh, we'll look in a minute at a list of, of the different headings, uh, departmental headings, as it were, who have an interest. But uh, looking at it rather more broadly than that, who is it that's got the problems? Whose life can you make easier in a way that benefits them and the company? Um, by addressing this whole broad subject of, of, of managing the information. Um, quite apart from that, who's got the budget? We may well find that the people with the problem, the problems are not the people with the budget, for example. Um, if one was to aggregate all the demands for information, all those things we just talked about, the legal need and HR need and all the rest of it, um, and uh, work out what the total cost across the whole organization is of dealing with them, uh, you begin to see how you can make a case for diminishing the pile, uh, for categorizing, for um, uh, find, at least finding out what you've got and where it is. Um, uh, people matter uh, in, in another way as well. Who in the organization or who can you get into the organization has got the skills to bring all these different interests together? Who's going to be looked at with authority? Um, there was an interesting discussion at a panel I did at Legal Tech about the names, the, 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 the titles given to the people who are going to hold these sorts of posts. Um, does it matter? Well, it probably does, um, that people have got titles that reflect responsibility and which sort of radiate authority. Otherwise, you're going to find no one's going to take any notice of you. Not least because one of yeah. And Chris, I'd say this is this is a difference um, from litigation, I think, and e-discovery in reactive litigation. Because when there's an emergency, uh, situational leaders will emerge that may or may not have a proper title. But when you're doing a project that's more formally chartered, it's it's very important to have um, uh, you know to have the executive sponsorship. Uh, to move the project through, in reactive litigation, generally the the you know legal gets to win uh, almost all arguments. But in a regular uh, project, a cross-functional project, legal doesn't always get to win. Yes, and there's an interesting parallel there because that, that picks up on that point. Um, when discovery was young, uh, when you and I were young, Mary, um, <laughs> the um, uh, we grew into the skills because somebody had to have them. There was a whole new problem that people didn't, uh, that there, there wasn't a, a body of people who had qualifications or uh, experience or whatever. People were moved from other functions. People put them, pushed themselves forward. People found themselves dumped with uh, new issues, new problems, uh, and they solved them. And they're now the ones who are in, their, in the law firms and organizations and in providers indeed who are leading the thought and leading the, the activity. We're not necessarily going to get that same impetus for these um, broader proactive things. We're going to have to identify people who won't necessarily um, already be in the organization who are going right. to uh, be the leaders. Right, and I think what you what you mentioned is is the self-taught um, self and the initiative that, that the community listening uh, has uh, experienced and put forth for their organizations um, and that has grounded the listeners here in cross-disciplinary skills. You probably, as um, most of you in the legal vertical, 
you probably know more about IT and privacy um, and uh, e-discovery than many others in your organizations who may be more siloed. Yeah, and we come back to who's got the need, um, who's available to address that need. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it may not be somebody you've already got. Um, uh, I find all this encouraging in the sense that if new, where new jobs are being created, there are opportunities, and there are opportunities not just for the old but also for the young um, to identify an area that isn't going to go away. Um, we, uh, you know, the, everybody's demonstration begins by a recital of how much more data there is year on year, which gets slightly tiresome to listen to after a while, but is nevertheless true um, that uh, if one wants to if one looks at one's own personal career and say what problems aren't going to go away, um, this is one of them. And if we achieve nothing else out of this, it would be good to encourage people to think that they can apply the skills they've already got, um, their their interest and their brains and 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 so on, uh, to uh, a new area. Not not quite wild west, but uh, as you discover it was when it started, but nevertheless an area that's going to become uh, of increasing importance to uh, to, to companies. Um, just a look at the list, a list of some of those areas where the availability or the excessive availability of, of, of data is a problem. Um, I won't read through the list, but you can see uh, uh, that touches an awful lot of corners of an organization, um, as well as, as I, as I say, giving opportunities to, to people who don't necessarily um, don't necessarily come from any of those departments but who may um, consider that they've got a, a broader set of skills than is just applicable to the department that they're in amongst other things data is not just getting bigger it's also getting more complex all sorts of new issues are turning up they're all in many ways they're pluses they relate to uh, new means of communication, new means of getting things done, um, to mobility, to um, putting data in the cloud and all the benefits that come with that. Um, but it brings with it an area of complexity, uh, many areas of complexity. Uh, a nice phrase, I don't know where I got this one from, but um, business sensitive information meets bro mass broadcast capability uh, is quite a good way of putting this. Um, it becomes easier and easier to send stuff out of an organization. The time has passed when uh, IT thought they'd, they'd got it all nailed down. I remember talking to somebody who worked in a bank who'd, um, years ago, years and years ago, who'd put a, I think he put, in those days, it was probably a floppy disk, put it into his computer. And eight minutes later, somebody from IT turned up at his desk and said, what are you doing that for? Um, the, the IT had got it sort of, under control, uh, and that's all gone. Uh, there's nothing to stop a uh, an employee, um, or at least on, on the face of it, there's nothing to stop an employee from getting data out, getting data in indeed, getting applications in. The stuff that might come into a company can be just as um, as full of risk as, as loss. And um, IT has more or less lost control of that. How are we going to deal with that? Well, it, it Policies has to be the answer. There has to be a, um, a set of instructions, guidelines, uh, help even. There's a much overlooked aspect of, of policy um, in this area. How, do you, uh, how does an organization help the people who want to use their uh, tablet, their smartphone, whatever, uh, for good business purposes? Uh, that brings risk, but just to say you can't do it uh, is not exactly helpful. So um, uh, we need to address this whole question of what the policies are. I know of at least one major US corporation who spent a lot of time on it and gave up. <laughs> they, they found it was too big to deal with. And um, they'll come back to it, I'm sure. But um, uh, that nice little few words there, have policies to fill the gap that I put on the slide. Uh, it's, so not intended, it's not intended to suggest that it's easy. So, Chris, when you, when you say they they trying to address it, were they addressing the bring your own device, or were they addressing something broader? 
it was it was it was a, a, the, a broader set of things of which BYOD was one, mm -hmm. but it was mainly how do we get the um, uh, the value that we'd like to get out of people um, being in touch, having these means of communication, um, being able to work wherever. How do we get all the value that the corporation needs out of that, and the goodwill you get from the the staff uh, if you have a um, a, a, a relaxed attitude to that in circumstances where that relaxed attitude uh, is itself potentially dangerous mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, it, it's important in all this to make it clear that merely asserting that one needs policies or uh, that one should do this or should do that um, none of us is suggesting that any of it's easy uh, because yes. it isn't. Um, this crossover that uh, we've, we've talked about the idea that different pools of people within an organization may have um, interests that overlap, legal, HR, IT, whatever. Um, it happens all the time, but there's still in many organizations, if not most, a lack of any sort of formal relationship. And um, we had a good example here of uh, different interest groups when uh, a couple of weeks ago, some UK judges were sacked uh, because they'd been caught viewing porn on court um, computers. Um, and no doubt it was IT that found them. Uh, it was HR who presumably devised the policies which made it um, wrong to do it. And no doubt legal got involved in the, um, the business of, of getting rid of them. Uh, what was interesting there was that they were all caught at once in different courts. There was nothing, no, no connection between them, uh, which implied to me that IT had recently either paid more attention to this or bought themselves some new software tools that network software tools um, that allowed them to uh, to find these things but a good example there of um, parties needing to work together uh, different parties within an organization needing to work together uh, in relation to the data and then also uh, having the having the policies that what can an IT person look at uh, because if you have judges, you've got some very sensitive information that you wouldn't necessarily want uh, every IT person to, to, to look at the content. Yep. So, so what tools are available to allow the, uh, the function to be fulfilled without uh, impacting the security and confidentiality of data? Yeah, well clearly you need someone with an overview of at least those three groups. Uh, legal HR and IT to work out what the problem is and how it's going to be addressed. And that's not necessarily a, a sort of a major everyday example, but it's one example that just happened to come up in the news of um, that overlap between functions. Whose problem is this? Uh, always important to identify who's got the problem before one tries to solve it. Um, there, there's potential conflicts here. The IT has a, a, a clear set of duties. They've got to keep data. They've got to back it up. They've got to provide the the systems across which it is um, delivered to the users. Um, and uh, their priority on the whole will be to uh, magnify. It won't, won't be the priority, but it be the consequence of their priorities that they magnify the amount of data that's kept, uh, if only by, by backups. Um, the legal department has a priority to be able to find stuff. What have we got on this? Um, I need it quickly. I need uh, an unspecified scope quickly. It's not you know, quite often. It's not. I need something specific, which is relatively easy. But it, where you where the the question is, I need to know everything that there is about this. Um, that's rather more difficult. That requires software tools. That requires skills, uh, and so on. But you can instantly see a conflict there. Um, the the uh, the keeping of everything tends to militate against uh, both the, the protection of data uh, and its retrieval when it's needed. Um, it's not that lawyers are in favor of deleting stuff, don't get me wrong on that. Um, the, the, the instinct of a, of a lawyer in most cases is to say, well, let's keep it just in case. And it's perhaps worth having somebody within the organization who asks the question, just in case of what? What is the risk? That we're uh, heading off or, or diminishing by keeping all this data and that's not a bad exercise anyway 
um, whether you're an outside lawyer advising the, the corporation or, or within the organization where, where somebody maintains that we ought to keep another copy or we ought to keep all this or whatever. Um, uh, ask the question, why? Um, that again is not to imply that it's easy to make the, the decisions about getting rid of stuff, but if you come back to those, um, the lawyers in the survey that we referred to at the beginning with their problem constantly firefighting, constantly trying to do things faster and whatever, um, it's not difficult to begin an argument that says if you had less stuff, uh, you'd find it easier to lay your hands on whatever it is you need at the moment when you need it. Uh, there's another element of that, um, uh, certainly in the EU, where uh, data protection laws limit the amount of data that you keep, uh, if it's got personally identifiable information in it. Uh, actually keeping it may be unlawful anyway. You're supposed to use it only for the purpose for which it was collected uh, and to delete it when that purpose is at an end. Well, if you don't know that you've got it and you don't know who's responsible for it, and you don't know what uh, PII there is in it, how are you going to comply with that? Even before you get to any discovery request, or a regulator's demand, um, where you you discover in the course of the e-discovery exercise that you've got a whole load of stuff that you shouldn't have, but which is, because it's still there, uh, discoverable. Um, it adds well, significantly to the cost. Well, not only discoverable, but depending on who your client is, you may have PCI data, the credit card data for financial, yep. or you might have health information. and these have clear um, regulations and laws um, governing governing the handling and notice provisions around uh, around that data. And then the FTC is beginning to uh, talk about data minimization as part of privacy by design. Yes. And and while it may not be unlawful here in the U.S., it's um, it'll be a factor. Uh, to consider if there's if there's a breach, so knowing where that PII is, that personal information, very very important. Yes, uh, I did a webinar the other day on cross border discovery and the uh, and and its U.S. internal equivalents, and um, uh, that FTC point was raised there. Uh, it's it's an interesting development that I think is going to focus minds a bit, um, certainly in some organisations. What is information governance, if we move on to that? Um, uh, there's lots of definitions around. The one I like is the one from the Information Governance Initiative, uh, of which Zilab is a charter supporter, uh, who define it this way. Information governance is the activities and technologies that organizations employ to maximize the value of their information while minimizing associated risks and costs. And that's pretty broad uh, as a definition. and. Um, uh, the, the critics will leap up and say, well, that's fine, but what does it actually mean in terms of what I do tomorrow? Well, we'll come on and look at that in a minute, uh, not least because the answer is going to be different for every organization. But the thing I like about this definition is that it puts value first and risk second. <coughs> uh, it tends to be overlooked that uh, in amongst all that stuff that people keep, uh, there's an immense amount of potential value. How do you get support for an IG project? Well, uh, you need a, uh, often you need a triggering event. As I said at, at the beginning, you, um, you may find that uh, you can add up the costs of carrying on as you are and uh, decide uh, with some, uh, perhaps with some external help that you could reduce those costs by more than the uh, amount that you've spent and improve the business and improve people's lives while you're doing it. Um, on the whole, you need some sort of, of, of trigger and it may be some sort of consolidation, um, you know, consolidating your servers or, or whatever, you're moving to Office 365. Um, your existing email archive, which you've used for years, uh, has got to be retired perhaps because its uh, supplier has gone out of business or, or um, end of life did, and it's all got to be moved somewhere. Um, uh, they're all, these are all good ways to, 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 to get going with a, a project aimed not just at deleting stuff. I don't think we, we, we need to avoid conflating information governance and defensible deletion as if they were the same thing. 
um, the defense of deletion or deletion of, of various kinds tends to be a relatively hard-edged project that one can get one's teeth in. But the best one tends to be the ones we started with, the discovery and the, the, the regulatory demands and all those things, uh, where it ought to be possible to identify what the costs are of doing nothing, uh, of just leaving things as they are, because time and time again, you're applying through the same data over and over again. Um, and I've always thought it might be interesting to have some sort of system that would identify data that has been collected multiple times and never used. Um, <laughs> that, must, that must be a, uh, a pretty obvious candidate for, uh, for deletion if we've collected it 18 times and, and not, dis not given discovery of it once. Um, perhaps we ought to start considering, and nobody's accessed it for any other reason, um, perhaps we should start considering getting rid of it. You know, that's, re that's really interesting because uh, e-discovery requests, once they've been, uh, once the data is collected, provides a wonderful uh, test bed for uh, creating the ROI that Chris is, uh, Chris is talking about because you know what your, uh, uh, what your retention policies are and then you know the data that you've pulled up and you can add you should know the metrics on review per page and processing and all of that, storage over time. And you can, you can get quite a big number, uh, especially uh, organizations that have a lot of litigation. But of course, you've taken it a step further, and that's um, uh, in, uh, certainly in the United States with our broader discovery that uh, uh, just because something's been collected and give, given over or but not necessarily used at trial, um, well, I was really thinking of the stuff that gets collected um, but falls by the wayside somewhere along the line in the in the coming or the review oh, process. Oh, I see where you're going. I right. see where if you're going. Uh -huh. if there's a great body of stuff that time after time has been identified as being potentially discoverable, mm -hmm. um, but which uh, after uh, a review has been discarded and can, you know, it's been decided that it is not discoverable. It doesn't fit within the request. It, it's not, uh, it's not relevant. Well, do that a few times. You're spending an awful lot of money per document, never mind per block of documents. Yeah, um, and well, in order, in order to do that, you need to have a system that will, uh, that will track that, mm -hmm. uh, track that it's been that 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 particular file or that particular custodian's material has been requested over time. And how uh, difficult that, is that? Well, for <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to get commercial here, Chris. <laughs> Chris, but when you do have your you, when you have control of your e-discovery behind the firewall, yep. it's not difficult at all to do that. Yeah, um, all, all of which supports, to my eye anyway, the idea that that uh, e-discovery for whatever purpose is a jolly good place to start thinking about do we need this stuff anyway? Um, the Mary mentioned at the beginning the idea that the new rules are, are going to make people a little more relaxed than they have been about the fear of being sanctioned for non-production. I should add here, the rest of the world gapes in astonishment at the whole US, um, the way US discovery is developed um, to induce this fear, which isn't supported by the rules or by uh, the case law, um, that oversight is going to um, get you sanctioned for millions of dollars. Uh, nevertheless, the rule change is intended to and will, I'm sure, but but not immediately, uh, will have the effect of making people more receptive to the idea that they get rid of stuff. Uh, the very worst thing to do, and one hears of it often, uh, is people who, uh, having come to the end of a case or whatever, decide they're going to keep everything that was used in it just in case uh, it's needed again, thereby, of course, multiplying the stock of data that they've got. Uh, that uh, may have to be reviewed the next time around. Yeah, exactly, and I, and I would say that it, um, even though it'll be a little more relaxed on the sanctions um, part of it, there um, there will be an incentive to know where your data is because if for some reason you haven't given over something that the other side can show is impactful for them, and I'm paraphrasing, um, uh, if you can uh, deliver it from another source or in another way, uh, it's easy to avoid the draconian uh, yes, sanctions indeed. 
and the new rules are talking about uh, cures that are no worse than the harm. So, um, so having a handle on what you have in your costs uh, to to supply it, are, are, those are going to be the sustaining things. A little bit different than um, uh, just adhering to a retention policy, which is which is what folks are doing around the uh, 37E. Yeah, just be uh, clear that, that 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 isn't an argument for keeping lots of stuff so that you've got a backup to go to. Oh, no, no, no. But knowing that you have the backup is a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But you don't need surplus, extra backups that, can, that are the, uh, the pot of stuff that you used three years ago for a case now dead. Exactly. Um, uh, if we move on and start looking at some of the requirements, most of these we've touched on one way or another, uh, the need for an internal champion. Uh, it's a trite observation to say that you need senior support. You need at least somebody who can uh, has got a, a, an overview and the authority to uh, find out what's going on and perhaps to direct. Um, even better, not just directing, but uh, being able to offer the encouragement to uh, these the other departments uh, to think that their lives may be made easier. They may become better contributors to the company. The company may become a better company. Um, uh, if it can deal with these things, that's that sort of starts shading off into um, uh, slightly woolly things. Um, whereas our focus has to be on the, the more hard-edged corporate benefits, the, the risks that you're avoiding, um, the value that you're uncovering, um, uh, and and trying to find a, a, a return on investment. Uh, Barclay Blair of the Information Governance Initiative has a lovely expression about that. Um, where he says that uh, ROI is often a retrospective justification uh, overlaid over a decision that was already made. Um, and I, th I think in many cases that's true. Uh, nevertheless, one must uh, try to seek out uh, where, where there's to be value, where, where uh, a saving or a benefit is going to arise. Um, perhaps by picking on examples within the organization where you can see money dripping through the floorboards, uh, you can see business being lost, um, and being able to show how, if one had a better handle on the data, uh, that um, loss could be turned into value. Uh, one needs a program, everything one does uh, of this kind needs a program, unlike uh, e-discovery where you may need a, a process but you don't necessarily need a, um, a preordained program because you didn't know yesterday that you were going to have the problem. Um, how do you set about it? Well, you need to define some policies. What are you trying to achieve? How are you going to achieve it? Um, what tools are you going to use? Which people are going to use them? Um, training. How are you going to uh, get people not just to buy into the, 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 the problem? Um, but be equipped with the, the right skills to do it and encourage people to think that those skills are uh, make them more saleable the next time around, if you see what I mean. Um, I was at a, an event a while back and uh, uh, somebody from a big organization said they'd gone through this. It had been directed from the top. They'd been told they must um, uh, identify candidates for deletion. They must categorize material. They must uh, generally get on top of it. Uh, all in addition to the jobs they were doing anyway. This wasn't um, new appointments to uh, solve a problem. This was something they were supposed to do in tandem with their own problems. And uh, she said at the end of it, well, it wasn't much fun, but uh, we see the value of it now that we're, we're through it. And um, those are the sorts of things one needs to try and anticipate and use as part of the, the selling, if you see what I mean. Um, after you've done that, well, have you done it well? Uh, can you audit the results? Is there a method of measuring whether you've succeeded? Uh, and can you adjust for those things that perhaps haven't worked as you hope they would? And then one of the adjustments I'd say is that um, the job descriptions that people are working under and the um, KPIs, the key performance indicators, or their MBOs or management by objectives, uh, these are things that can uh, be written and uh, folks can start having some accountability, some responsibility uh, for these uh, policies, programs, implementation. And all of that is 
uh, is very helpful for evaluations, for salary increases, for advancement, and as, as Chris uh, mentioned, for the next time around. Yeah, but that you just, uh, with the way you've put it into real hard edge things like you may, may be able to earn more money. Uh, you, may, <laughs> um, uh, it, you may acquire a set of skills uh, as well as pleasing those above you, you may actually acquire a set of skills. I, I, this is the third time I've mentioned it in the course of this talk, but it's, I think, an important part of the whole business because it makes it um, more interesting to people in the widest sense of that term. Um, uh, that if, if there's a, a, a personal benefit to be gained out of it. The other thing I'd, I'd say for, for is much with e-discovery, it gives you a very broad view of, of the business uh, or that that your company's in, or that your client's company is in, uh, and where their opportunities and threats are, it makes you um, makes you much more valuable uh, as as an employee or colleague. Um, yep, yeah. indeed. Um, this next page is there's a, um, a load of things we've already talked about and things that are quite hard to define, but nevertheless. Um, uh, Identifying, for example, the things that cause grief. Um, what, if you're going to ask people, what stands in your way of doing, um, doing better, of the company doing better? Um, uh, quite that won't be exclusively a data issue, but quite often that will turn out to be the issue. Um, where are savings to be made? Uh, in um, the British civil service at the moment, uh, has got itself a bad name for. Uh, thinking that savings simply mean that you cut services and sack staff. Well, that's not so. Um, that may be the right answer in some cases, but um, there's very often more positive ways of um, uh, of improving the business. And by improving it, I mean uh, improving both the top line and the bottom line. Um, what are the easy kills? Where will the 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 least amount of work show the most return? Which tends to be important when you want to get your having hard having got your hard won budget, you want it renewed the next year. Uh, if you've identified in that first year uh, the areas where, for the least input, you can get the most obvious, clear return, uh, that tends to give projects a longer life than just the first budget year. Um, as well as identifying where the risks are and risks shift. Um, uh, cyber risk has has become see, to be seen as a much bigger risk than it was seen two years ago, and almost all breaches have a tail. Um, they have well, there's a lot of work involved in them, and litigation often results. You get angry shareholders, uh, all sorts of um, bad press, all sorts of things flow from that. Um, uh, you don't necessarily solve the problem by a program of information governance, but you can at least. Uh, reduce its effect. Uh, if you've got a handle on, on, on the data, where it lies, and who's responsible for it. And again, a trite point, what, what business objectives are we serving here? Is something that uh, uh, one must focus on. Focus on. Um, and here's some examples of that. Uh, the, the, the one we kicked off with, that the lawyers keep asking for documents, which is costing us a fortune to find, is a, a, a pretty hard-edged and uh, I say measurable, it ought to be measurable, What you've, as, as we've just discussed, um, what you've spent that you didn't need to spend multiplied by the number of cases for which that occurred. Um, uh, the the end-of-life archiving system, which I, I referred to earlier, the idea that you just pick everything up and dump it somewhere else, doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Uh, it'll take time involves labor uh, you'll probably have to buy some hardware or pay some pay somebody else to provide their hardware um, uh, if you're putting it in the cloud for example there are license costs all sorts of additional costs come if the way you deal with an end-of-life situation is simply to pick stuff up and drop it somewhere else um, uh, the inability to comply with your own policies you you've got a uh, an expensively acquired set of policies for data retention, uh, but you can't actually comply with that. Um, doesn't look good when uh, you deny that you've got stuff, but it subsequently turns out that you have, for example, uh, in say a regulatory context. 
uh, the uh, the staff spending hours looking for stuff. Uh, I have no idea where this figure came from, but there's a a, a, a stat that floats around that people spend 40% of their day looking for stuff. Well, I know I have <laughs> days when 40% of my day disappears because I can't find stuff easily. Um, and that's just uh, me in a, a one-man office. Uh, multiply that across uh, many uh, workers. Um, and there's loss there. Uh, the, the the two at the bottom there, losing pitches to better informed rivals and, and a, a longer time between uh, inception and, and billing. Um, those You can look at those as, as downsides or you can use a sort of glass half full, glass half empty things. The, the opposite of them is that you start winning pitches because you can get there faster, you've got better information and so on. Um, uh, that you can reduce the timeline uh, before you can render a bill. Um, all good stuff, all, all positive as well as um, uh, the curing of a negative, if you see what I mean. Uh, lastly, and we're, we're nearly out of time here, um, how do you describe it? The, uh, these examples I, I, I've taken from, from the excellent Barclay Blair. Um, Information governors helped us to comply with laws and regulations for our information. Well, great, what does that mean? Um, if you can instead say something like, IG helped our clinical trials managers reduce errors and produce better data, reducing time to market. There's a, a hard-edged, specific value proposition. Um, not uh, IG helped us manage our information better, but we were able to close our projects faster. Uh, so we get the money faster a year, a year or a year and a half earlier. If you can say something like that, then that's a um, a, a valuable proposition uh, that those above you in an organisation can see a value in that. I said I'd come back to the quotation I started with um, from Gartner that being proactive requires the uh, the, the the same um, uh, approaches. Uh, just without the pressure of deadlines, is a, um, a, a nice, short, snappy way of saying what we've just taken an hour to say. Um, and I think is a valuable proposition. Um, we're nearly out of time, and we haven't left a great deal of time for questions. Do we have any questions? We do have several questions, Chris. Uh, this is Robert, by the way. Um, I, I am mindful that we have two minutes left, so let's get to one quickly if we can. Um, we've seen that some organizations, we, we talked a lot about this on the call, are redeploying e-discovery resources to these other areas, privacy and security uh, being a couple of the big ones that we mentioned. Um, and in a sense, it kind of seems like e-discovery departments might be victims of their own efficiency, so to speak. So the question is, what impact, uh, and Chris, I'll ask you this, what impact will that uh, that bandwidth constraint they have on corporate e-discovery practices kind of more broadly? Well, one likes to hope that e-discovery is going to diminish as a problem uh, as the tools get better, as people get um, more used to the idea that you don't have to give discovery of everything. Um, uh, we're seeing um, various shifts that imply that although the volume is going up, um, the tools are perhaps keeping pace. I'm not, I think Jason Barron, for example, says the opposite. He says that the data, the data is getting bigger uh, and whilst analytic tools get better and better, um, they're not keeping pace with it. Um, I think we must see over time a shift towards the skills being deployed for the proactive purpose because that, that, that we just described, because that has to uh, diminish the costs, it has to deal with this uh, ever more uh, increasing volume. Uh, that, that I'm, I am convinced that we will see that as uh, the way to go. All right, very good. Uh, Mary, anything to, to chime in with quickly? Uh, I'd just say that what I've, what I've heard is that uh, even though class actions have diminished, the ones that are occurring right now are around privacy and security. So as, um, uh, as, they, as those practitioners start experiencing investigations and litigation, that the skills that the e-discovery community bring are going to be very, very important, and I think that that's the crossover point. All right.
we'll leave it there. Uh, Mary, I want to thank you. Uh, Chris, I want to thank you. This has been an excellent presentation. It's always, uh, I think, these discussions when both of you are on the line are among the best. So uh, well done. Thank you. Thank you very much for asking. Thanks, Thanks for the invitation, Ravi. All right. I want to thank everyone on the call as well. Uh, the recording of this presentation as well as the, as well as the slides will be posted on ACES.org. I also encourage you to go, uh, again, watch this at xylab.com. They also have a ton of other great resources, including white papers, uh, case studies, brochures, et cetera. Um, so again, xylab.com. All right, everyone. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Bye.